good afternoon. I'm Fred Gilman, the uh, Buell Professor of Theoretical Physics and Dean of the Mellon College of Science. And associated with the chair that I hold is this annual Buell Lecture. So welcome to this year's lecture, which is the 14th uh, since this series was restarted in 1996. Today's Buell Lecture is Rocky Call. He was the founding head in 1983 of the Theoretical Astrophysics Group at Fermilab and in 2004, the founding director of the Particle Astrophysics Center. Today, he's Arthur Holly Compton, Distinguished Service Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and also the chair of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago. In addition to over 200 scientific papers that flow from his research on particle physics and the history of the very early universe, he's the co-author of The Early Universe, the standard textbook on particle physics and cosmology. Rocky's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Physical Society, and the recipient of the 2003 Orsted Medal of the American Association of Physics Teachers, and the 1993 Quantel-Contrell Prize for Teaching Excellence at the University of Chicago. His book for the general public, Line Watchers of the Sky, received the 1996 Emmy Award of the American Aeronautical Society. Now, as many of you know, Rocky gave a previous lecture, in fact, the second of the revived uh, Buell lectures, in 1997, which was to, uh, titled From the Primordial Soup to Pittsburgh. And during that lecture, Rocky revealed the can of primordial soup. You recognize the label, the uh, colors, but it says Fermilab primordial soup instead on it. And then he handed it to the then provost with a warning not to open it because of the danger that such an act would present. Fortunately, I safely removed the can from the hands of the provost and have saved it to this very day, never uh, opening it, uh, though it's been quite a topic of conversation for various people visiting my office. Now, today I wouldn't open it either, even though it's only about a billionth of the lifetime of the universe later, not so much for the original reasons as the life forms that came much later in the history of the universe that I might uh, unveil by opening it at this stage. But there's another reason not to open it and keep it closed. That's because at the time of the last lecture, dark energy had not been discovered. So I suspect that what's in here has got dark matter, but not dark energy. And so I'm gonna keep this can for a universe that never was, with dark matter in it, but no dark energy. But after today's lecture, I expect that it can. So to tell us about the universe and our understanding of it today, and how we'll explore it and understand dark energy and dark matter. We have back by popular demand, Rocky Paul, and Mysteries of the Dark Universe. Thank you, Fred. It's a pleasure to be back. When uh, Fred contacted me and uh, invited me to give the Buell lecture, I was sort of embarrassingly said, but I've already given one. And he said, well, we want you to keep giving it till you get it right. <laughs> and also, if you check that can of soup, Fred, you'll see there's an expiration date on the universe. <clears throat> this evening, I will talk about mysteries of the dark universe. For thousands of years, astronomers looked up into the sky and charted the location and apparent movements of stars. But the nature of stars, what they are made of and how they shine, was a cosmic mystery until the 20th century when, with the input of quantum physics, astrophysicists were able to understand what powers the stars and what they're made of why the stars shine, and what they're made of. And that cosmic mystery was solved. Also at the beginning of the 20th century, astronomers used new generations of large telescopes to look beyond the stars in our galaxy and discover a universe full of galaxies. But the nature 
of these extra galactic objects remained a mystery until the Big Bang Theory predicted the expansion of the universe, and that cosmic mystery was solved with the Big Bang Theory. As we begin the 21st century, we're faced with two cosmic mysteries, and these two cosmic mysteries have names, but no understanding. We have names for two phenomena that are a mystery to us. One we call dark matter. Dark matter is just a name for whatever it is that's holding galaxies together. We think it's a new type of elementary particle, but it's still a mystery. We have the, another phenomenon that is a mystery to us, and that we call dark energy. This seems to be a property of empty space, an energy or a mass to empty space that drives galaxies and other structures apart in the cosmic expansion. These are the two mysteries that are facing cosmologists at the beginning of the 21st century. Now, I just uh, last week filled in this little form and where it said occupation, I wrote cosmologist. I don't know if anyone reads that form, but uh, perhaps they think this person does not know how to spell cosmetologist. <laughs> but cosmology and cosmetology are different. And the way to keep them apart, uh, cosmetology studies the universe of makeup, and cosmology studies the makeup of the universe. One studies Big Bang, the other Big Bangs. <laughs> cosmology, thank Rich. <laughs> uh, cosmology is one of the oldest professions. There was a famous American anthropologist, George Murdoch, who surveyed every society known to anthropology, both historic and prehistoric societies. And what he uh, realized is that all, all of these societies shared some activities that he described as cultural universals. And among the cultural universals were religious rituals. Every society has religious rituals of some type or another. Every society has some sort of marriage taboos. Every society, it turns out, seems to make alcoholic beverages. Every society has some sort of body adornment. So in fact, cosmetology is a cultural universal also. And every society has had a cosmology. Every society known to history and presently today have a cosmology, a view of the universe an attempt to answer simple questions like, where did the universe come from? How old is the universe? What's in the universe? These are simple questions that cosmologists uh, attempt to answer. The aim of modern cosmology is to not only to see what's in the universe, but to peer behind what we see in the universe and to discern how the universe works, not just what's out there and how it moves, but and how it moves, but why does it move in that way? Now, in previous times, people had ideas of crystalline spheres or mechanical gears or other sundry devices, but now we try to understand how the universe works on the basis of the laws of nature. As I said, cosmologists try to answer simple questions. Sometimes the answers aren't so simple but the questions are often simple. And one of the simple questions is, what's in the universe? What is the universe made of? It's a question someone four or five years old could ask. The answer to this question seems to be surprisingly complicated. And we have a standard model of cosmology today that seems to explain all of the cosmological observations but it has a remarkably complex composition of the universe today. And this composition is best described in terms of this uh, pie chart. And I'd like to go through some of the ingredients of the present universe with you. The early universe was dominated by radiation, but today in the cold universe, 
Radiation consists of only about 0.005% of the mass energy of the universe. <clears throat> this chart also illustrates why chemistry is not very important. <laughs> the, the chemical elements, by which I mean elements other than hydrogen and helium, comprise only 0.025% of the mass energy of the universe. It's a mystery to me why anyone would invest time in such an insignificant fraction of the universe. <laughs> There's a much larger fraction of the universe in the form of elementary particles known as neutrinos. A neutrino is like an electron if you went in with a very small pair of tweezers and extracted the electric charge from the electron, what would be left behind is a neutrino. Neutrinos are all around us. Billions of them will pass through your body during this lecture. You don't feel them. Stars, the traditional thing astronomers study, is only 0.8% of the universe. Most of the normal stuff in the universe is hydrogen and helium gas that's not in the form of condensed objects, but is in the form of a gas in clusters. Now, the remarkable thing about this chart is if we add up all of the things we know about that we can explain and we understand, it makes up only 5% of the total mass energy of the universe. There's something holding galaxies together that we call dark matter that seems to make up 25% of the present mass energy of the universe. And there seems to be something else that's pushing galaxies apart in the cosmic expansion. We call it dark energy. And that represents about 70% of the mass energy of the universe. 95% of the universe today is a mystery to us. It's the mysteries of the dark universe. Now, this is part of a model of the universe. But what I've learned in talking to my colleagues in other disciplines is that what a, what a physical scientist, at least, means by a model, implies by a model, is something different than what our colleagues in the social sciences or other areas uh, describe as a model. For instance, there was a 20th century economist who worked uh, mostly at MIT, and uh, he wrote about models in economics. He wrote that the construction of a model consists of snatching for the enormous and complex mass of facts called reality a few simple, easily managed key points, which when put together in some cunning way becomes for certain purposes a substitute for reality itself. So economists have a model, and in their model, they don't have anything dark, but they have an invisible hand that's responsible for taking money out of your pocket and spreading it around through the economy. Now, I don't think economists believe that there are actually invisible hands, but cosmologists think that there actually is dark matter and dark energy. The question facing us today is whether dark energy and dark matter is a substitute for reality itself or if it is actually part of reality itself. Now, in terms of forming this cosmological model that tells us there should be dark matter and dark energy, it's based upon a theory for the origin and evolution of the universe. And this theory is the Big Bang Theory. We've all heard of the Big Bang Theory. And there are some people who say that it's just a theory. Now, as a theoretical physicist, I don't like to hear people say it's just a theory. Theories are beautiful things. Just because something, there's a difference between a theory and something that's just wild, unsupported conjecture. Evolution is just a theory that doesn't mean everything else is equally possible or equally probable. And people who say that if it's just a theory, we should teach all possibilities, I'd like to remind them that gravity is just a theory. And when you approach the edge of a cliff, please consider all possibilities. <laughs> but in fact, the Big Bang is more than a theory. It's much more than a theory. It is a television program. <laughs> and this gives it immediate importance and credence. And in fact, 
you know, there's people in philosophy of science who argue that theories can only be shown to be wrong. You can never prove a theory right. You can never validate a theory. But they never anticipated the power of the networks. <laughs> and in fact, it is possible to validate a theory. And the Big Bang Theory has been validated. So we'll take it as a fact. <laughs> now, the emergence of the Big Bang Theory, our present cosmology, involves something that previous cosmologies did not. It involves the nature of space and time. And to understand the presence of dark matter and dark energy, we have to understand something about the nature of space and time. Whether we realize it or not, in our everyday actions, we operate in a classical or Newtonian picture of space and time. In Newton's remarkable book, The Principia, he wrote about space and time. He wrote that absolute space remains always similar and immovable. And he wrote about absolute true and mathematical time, which has no relation to anything external. So in the Newtonian view of space and time, space and time are fixed. And physics is played out on this fixed playing field of space and time. So physicists study velocities through space, changes of things with respect to time, but space and time remain fixed. This view of space and time changed at the beginning of the 20th century with the work of Albert Einstein. In 1905, while a third-class patent clerk, Einstein looked at, equa at equations he was scribbling when his boss wasn't looking at him and came to the conclusion that the way humanity had viewed space and time for tens of, tens of thousands of years was wrong. Space and time are not separate. They are, in fact, relative. Einstein didn't stop there. Ten years later, while a professor at the University of Berlin he looked at equations and came to the conclusion that the way we have viewed geometry, at least since the time of Euclid, was incomplete, and that space and time are not fixed and absolute. They can be curved and warped and bent. And this uh, con concept that space and time can be curved and warped and bent was part of his theory of gravity. And only when Einstein developed his theory of gravity did cosmology become a science? One of the first applications of Einstein's theory of gravity that Einstein did was to try to understand something about the universe. So Einstein's theory of gravity is the basis that we use to understand the universe. It's the basis of the Big Bang Theory. So in some sense, Einstein's equations, his theory of gravity, are the modern commandments of Genesis. Now, everyone is familiar with the one equation I'll show in this lecture, the Einstein field equations. And some of you are familiar with the fact that it looks like one equation, but actually it's a shorthand notation for 10 nonlinear partial differential equations. So it's sort of the 10 commandments of Genesis, right? Now, a couple of you who are technically um, astute with Einstein's theory of gravity would put up their hand and say, but you only have to obey six of the equations, just like the Ten Commandments, right? Six, <laughs> four are optional. Six out of ten is a pretty good day for a lot of people. <laughs> so the technical thing about Einstein's equations that's important tonight is that it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side. The left-hand side of Einstein's equations describe geometry in space and time, curvature of space, expansion of space. That's all on the left side of the Einstein equations. On the right side of the Einstein equations is all of the information we have about matter and radiation and forces, how matter and radiation are distributed in space, what sort of forces are acting on them, that all goes on the right side of Einstein's equations. So Einstein's theory of gravity is based upon the idea that gravity is related to geometry, the left-hand side. It's the curvature of space that we interpret as a gravitational field. 
and it is determined by the distribution and nature of what's on the right-hand side, the matter and radiation in the universe. So in the years 1915 to 1916, Einstein developed his theory of gravity related to geometry, which is determined by matter and radiation. And it was a simple, beautiful, and elegant theory. Many people think it's the most beautiful theory ever constructed. Then Einstein tried to apply his new theory of gravity to study cosmology. Because Einstein was dismayed to discover that his theory did not conform to the universe as he thought it should exist. Einstein was educated in the 19th century with the idea that the universe is eternal, it's stationary, it's unchanging. Einstein could not find solutions to his simple, beautiful, and elegant theory that described a universe that was stationary. He could find solutions where the universe expanded or contracted, but he could not find solutions where it was stationary. So Einstein did something remarkable in 1917. He added something that technically we describe as a fudge factor. He added a new term to his equations in order to find a solution to his equations that described a stationary, eternal universe. And there was a constant in this term he added that he described as the cosmological constant. So the cosmology of Einstein, which only lasted 12 years, depended upon three parts. One is this, his theory of gravity, which was related to geometry. It described a stationary, eternal universe, and it had this additional term that he described as the cosmological term. I think that now, for the first time in history, cosmology is a science. People have always, had always speculated about the nature of the universe, the nature of the cosmos, but now it was based upon a theory of physics, and it had an aspect that we demand of science, it could be shown to be wrong. It could be falsified. And that is what happened when in 1929, the cosmology of the greatest authority of si in science, or at least in physics of the 20th century, was shown to be wrong on the basis of observations made by a basketball player. Now, not any basketball player, but a basketball player on the last decent athletic team of the University of Chicago <laughs> of the 1909 National Championship basketball team. And if people would ask me the real difference between Carnegie Mellon and Chicago is that Chicago is an athletic powerhouse. The forward on this 1909 National Championship basketball team you've heard of, his name was Edwin Hubble. In about, in less than a month, there is scheduled to be a launch of the space shuttle to send astronauts up to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. The astronaut leading that mission is John Grunsfeld, who, was, who went to the University of Chicago. So when he was assigned to lead this mission, he gave us a call and said, is there anything that Hubble left behind at the University of Chicago that I could take up on the space shuttle to visit the Hubble Space Telescope? And we poked around and we discovered that basketball. <laughs> so we shipped it off to John and he managed, after only three months of arguing, to convince NASA to let him take this basketball up in space. And uh, so when you see television, you, see, you, you will see astronauts passing around a basketball. It is a basketball that Hubble played with in 1909. I don't think he imagined that that basketball would ever be up in space. What Hubble discovered that disprove the cosmology of Einstein is that space expands. The universe is not stationary or everlasting or eternal. 
Hubble discovered that space is expanding. Einstein at first didn't believe the observations, but after only a couple of years, he was convinced. So he described his introduction of the cosmological constant as his biggest blunder and returned to his simple, beautiful, and elegant theory that he had developed in 1916. Another hallmark of science is that a theory or a model will make predictions that one can go out and test. Among the predictions of the Big Bang Theory is the prediction that there should be a background of radiation that is a remnant of the hot primordial fireball. This prediction was confirmed in 1965 when Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson discovered the, hot, the remnants of the hot primordial fireball in terms of a background radiation at a temperature of three degrees above absolute zero or minus 270 degrees Celsius. I guess that's something like minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. Another prediction of the Big Bang has to do with the chemical abundance of the elements. Now, let me remind you why no one likes chemistry. <laughs> there are, frankly, too damn many elements. We don't need all these. Every high school chemistry teacher or uh, student I speak to says, wouldn't it be great if we could study Greek chemistry? They only had four elements, air, earth, water, and fire. Out of this, they can make everything. I tell them that, in fact, they should study cosmological chemistry because we only have three elements <laughs> in our periodic table. We have hydrogen, helium, and anything that's not hydrogen and helium, we just call a metal. <laughs> Chemistry is really simple. Now, we do this for two reasons. One, it really annoys chemists. And the other reason is that 99% of the universe today is hydrogen and helium. Only 1% of the universe that we see today of the elements that we're familiar with is in the form of anything that's not hydrogen and helium. So we can get a 99% on chemistry just by having hydrogen and helium in metals. Furthermore, we can determine the isotopic abundances of hydrogen and helium. And uh, 10 to the minus 5 of the hydrogen is in a form of heavy hydrogen known as deuterium. And uh, about the same fraction of helium is in a rare isotope of helium with only three neutrons and protons in the uh, helium nucleus. We understand this chemical abundance based upon what was produced in the Big Bang. That's the first step. So three minutes AB after the bang, it's predicted that the universe would have been 76% hydrogen, 24% helium, and it turned out that to make it through the first day, the universe needed just a little lithium. <laughs> Not much, about one part in 10 to the 10, the abundance of lithium in the uh, early, three minutes after the bang is comparable to the abundance of benzene in water that you drink. It's a very small fraction. This is the basis of understanding the chemical evolution of the elements. From this primordial mix of hydrogen and helium and lithium, the first generation of stars formed, and inside the stars was also hot enough to burn the hydrogen and helium through nuclear processes into the chemical elements that we see around us. Then those stars exploded, enriching the interstellar medium with heavier elements. So one of the remarkable conclusions of this picture is that every atom in your body that is not hydrogen and helium was once made in a star. So you can either, depending upon your point of view, view yourself as star material or nuclear waste. <laughs> so that's a brief rundown of our cosmology today. And the conclusion is that our universe emerged from a state of high temperature and density 
14 billion years ago and is expanding and cooling, evolving and dynamic. The universe emerged 14 billion years ago. Actually, I, uh, once w I was grading a test paper this year, and I asked my students that I teach, what is the age of the universe? And someone wrote, 14 billion years in two weeks. And I try to teach them, you know, accuracy and what you can say. So I marked it wrong, and the student came to me and said, how can this be wrong? Four, two weeks ago, you told us the universe was 14 billion years old. <laughs> Our universe is evolving, it's changing. The universe today is different than the universe a billion years ago. So this is a theory. However, we can show that this theory is correct because astronomers possess something that paleontologists do not have, that geologists do not have. Astronomers have time machines we are able to view the universe in the past. We have time machines. These time machines are telescopes. Because light travels at a finite velocity, as we look out in space, we're looking back in time. For instance, right now, the people in the back of the room look younger to me than the people in the front of the room because it's taken light. You know, the light from the people in the back of the room was emitted, oh, 100 nanoseconds earlier than the light from the people in the front of the room. As we look out in space, we're looking back in time. The farther out in space we look, the further back in time we can see. So the universe T tonight, we're looking at the universe as it exists 14 billion years after the bang. We can look out in space back in time to see the earlier universe, but there's a limit to how far we can look out in space and back in time. For the first 380,000 years of the history of the universe, it was so hot and dense that light could not travel through it. It was opaque. So there is a limit. We cannot directly look back in time earlier than 380,000 years after the bang. So I'll talk about ways we can look back to the hot primordial soup, but we can't do it directly. Now let me turn to the idea of dark matter. When we look at a galaxy, we can determine the mass of the galaxy in two ways, in at least two ways. One way we can determine the mass of a galaxy is just by seeing how bright it is. If we see how bright the galaxy is, we can get a good estimate of how many stars there are in the galaxy. We understand the masses of stars, so we can weigh a galaxy, determine its mass by seeing how bright it is. We can also determine the mass of a galaxy by measuring how rapidly it spins. The thing that's holding the galaxy together is gravity from all of the mass of the galaxy. The faster the galaxy is spinning, the more mass has to be there producing the gravity, holding the galaxy together. Now, if we compare the mass of a galaxy that we deduce by seeing how bright it is, with the mass of a galaxy that we calculate by measuring how rapidly it spins, we discover something that we refer to as an accounting irregularity. <clears throat> the numbers do not agree. It doesn't add up. Something's missing. We need a bailout, <laughs> a recovery. The bailout in this case is dark matter. There has to be more mass in the galaxy keeping it together than we can see in the form of stars or anything else that we can determine. This was really demonstrated in the late 1970s and early 1980s by the work of the great American astronomer Vera Rubin. And what she did was to measure the velocity of stars in the galaxy, or in our galaxy and distant galaxies, 
and graph them as a function of the distance of that star from the center of the galaxy. Based upon the estimate of what we see, how much mass is there in what we see, we would expect the curve to look something like this, but in fact the observations do not agree with what was expected just on the basis of what we see, so there must be more to the galaxy than we see, and this is what we call dark matter. So when we look at a galaxy, we're seeing only the tip of the iceberg. Most of the matter is dark, and it doesn't seem to be normal matter. Now, we don't see dark matter directly, but we can ask a computer to tell us what a galaxy would look like if we could see dark matter. And the computers should tell us that in fact, a galaxy, if we, we would see all of the mass, not just the visible mass, this is what a galaxy would look like. There's a disk in the center, which comprises the galaxy that we do see, the visible thing, but it's surrounded by a halo of dark matter that's dense in the center of the galaxy, then the density decreases as you go far away from the center of the galaxy. Furthermore, we expect there should be clumps of dark matter that we don't see in this galaxy. So we only see the tip of the iceberg. We only see the central bright part of the galaxy. It's surrounded by a halo of dark matter. What is this dark matter? What is the glue that's holding galaxies together? What, are, what is the missing piece? that we don't see. Well, there are various ideas. One idea is that Newtonian dynamics, or our theory of gravity, is wrong. And dark matter is not there, but somehow our theory of gravity is wrong, or Newtonian dynamics is wrong. Recent observations suggest that this is not the answer. Then there's the idea that the Dark matter is normal stuff, but it's concentrated in some astronomical objects that are difficult to see, like planets. Maybe our galaxy is just full of planet-sized hunks of rock. Or uh, objects that used to be called dwarf stars, but in fact now, uh, particularly at universities, they are, are referred to as size challenge stars. Size challenge stars are also light challenge stars. They would be very dim. Maybe our galaxy is just full of stars that have maybe one, two, five percent of the mass of the sun. Another possibility that's discussed is that most of the mass of our galaxy and most of the mass of the universe is in the form of black holes, which do not emit light that we can see. These ideas for dark matter are grouped under the name of Massive Astronomical Compact Halo Objects, or MACHOs. <clears throat> so one idea is that the universe, the mass of the universe, is dominated by MACHOs. Observations suggest that this is not the answer, and the best answer today seems to be that the mass of the universe is in the form of a new type of elementary particle, that has a mass and is very weakly interacting, so it's known as a weakly interacting massive particle or a WIMP. <laughs> Who could have predicted that WIMPs dominate the machos? WIMPs seem to be today the best explanation for this phenomenon that we refer to as dark matter, so let's explore the idea that the dark matter is a new elementary particle or a WIMP. This WIMP would have been produced in the first second of the history of the universe. This is the theory, but again, we have to find evidence to support this theory to see whether it's right or not. But recall, we can't look out in space back in time to see the hot primordial soup because the universe was opaque. We can't see through it. So we have to do something else, and what we can do is to reproduce in the laboratory, the conditions of the hot primordial soup. We make the primordial soup in the laboratory at particle accelerators 
uh, such as Fermilab, which is today, at least for the next couple of months, the most powerful accelerator, the most powerful time machine, because it recreates the conditions in the universe earlier than a second after the bang, and it is, in fact, a telescope, because it allows us to look back in time, therefore out in space. And so the product of Fermilab is the primordial soup. And uh, my friends, the experimentalists, spend countless hours trying to discover the ingredients of the primordial soup. And they discover all these ingredients like gluons, photons, croutons, all these other types of ingredients in the primordial soup. There's one ingredient that they're almost positive is there that they're looking for. And this is known as the Higgs boson. And they expect to find it any day. And it's a big secret at Fermilab whether the Higgs boson has been discovered, whether there's any glimpse of the Higgs boson. Now, if you promise not to tell anyone, right, that's just between us, uh, there is evidence for the Higgs bison at Fermilab. It's very massive, but not yet the Higgs boson. But if wimps are the answer, then there should be a secret ingredient in the primordial soup, and this secret ingredient is dark matter. Experimentalists are sorting through the debris of the collisions at accelerators looking for evidence of dark matter. If it was produced in the primordial soup of the Big Bang, we should be able to produce it in the primordial soup at accelerators. Perhaps Fermilab does not have enough energy to produce the WIMP, but there is a larger accelerator that's coming online sometime this summer at CERN in Switzerland, known as the Large Hadron Collider. It's not actually yellow. That is an uh, outline of where it would be under the Jura Mountains. And to give you an idea of the size, these are the Alps back there, and this is the Geneva Airport. Perhaps the discovery of the secret ingredient of the primordial soup, the discovery of dark matter of the WIMP will be made in Geneva and not in the US. There are other ways to test this idea that the dark matter is a WIMP. If it's around today, then they should be all around us, passing through us. Occasionally, they should just nudge an atomic nucleus Leading, giving it a very small recoil. Now, nothing that we can feel, but if you have an ultra-pure material that's ultra-cold, deep underground, shielded from cosmic rays, perhaps we can detect the evidence of the relic wimps. And there are experiments around the world looking for this. Another possibility is that the wimps are accumulating in the center of our galaxy where we expect the dark matter density to be large and annihilating, producing some strange signal that we can see with telescopes or satellites. So there are arrays of satellites today studying the galactic center. There are gamma ray telescopes on Earth looking toward the galactic center trying to detect evidence of the annihilation of WIMPs. So this is a particularly exciting time in this field because the race is on to discover the WIMP, to discover what most of the mass of the universe is comprised of. There are experiments underground. There are gamma ray observatories in Namibia and remote parts of the US, like Arizona looking up to see toward the galactic center to see the annihilation of WIMPs producing gamma rays. Fermilab is looking for WIMPs. This is a picture of a detector at CERN that will be looking for WIMPs. There are satellites in space, and the satellites that have been launched looking for evidence of WIMP annihilation. The race is on. Scientists are very excited because we feel that we're right on the verge of discovering the nature of the mass of the universe and understanding and solving the mystery of dark matter. 
But there's more to the dark side than just dark matter, and it goes back to the idea of Einstein's cosmological constant. Remember this story, in 1917, Einstein proposed the cosmological constant. In 1929, Dis Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe, and the reason Einstein originally proposed the cosmological constant went away, so Einstein called the introduction of the cosmological constant my biggest blunder. He didn't anticipate that 64 years later, astronomers would find evidence for the existence of the cosmological constant. So the lesson here, an important lesson, never admit you're wrong. <laughs> if Einstein had not admitted he was wrong, he could have been famous. <laughs> Einstein's cosmological constant, if it is the answer to the observation, is the unbearable lightness of nothing. It implies that empty space by itself has a mass of 10 to the minus 30 grams in every cubic centimeter. This is a remarkable result for two reasons. One is that it's not zero. You might think that empty space has no mass associated with it. It's also remarkable because it's so incredibly small, 10 to the minus 30 grams per cubic centimeter. Now, how have cosmologists and, and physicists reacted to this? Well, we've been hard at work and we have two great accomplishments. Returning to this history of Einstein's cosmological constant, since 1998, cosmologists have reintroduced it, but we've done something incredibly difficult, imaginative, and clever. We have gotten together and we've lifted up this term and moved it all the way to the other side of the equation. That is scientific progress. We've also developed a completely new and sexier name for it. Instead of a, who cares about a constant? It's just another constant. Now we call it dark energy. Doesn't that sound sexier and more mysterious? That is what we've accomplished in the last decade. Thank you. <laughs> now, how can empty space by itself have a, have a weight, have a mass? Well, I'm almost finished my next book titled Much Ado About Nothing. Maybe one day it will be a play or a discussion of the quantum vacuum. And this is sort of the Zen part of the lecture. So I want to say some words about nothing. So let's have a little Zen background. It's Zen, so you can't hear it. So four aspects of nothing. Nothing matters. Nothing is something. Nothing has energy. And nothing changes. Let's first go to the idea that nothing matters. If nothing has a mass, if there is a mass of space, then it determines the ultimate fate of the universe. The universe began 14 billion years ago last Tuesday and has been expanding. No, 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 no. no. But uh, if there's only dark matter in the universe, then the expansion of the universe will slow. The velocity of the expansion will slow because gravity will pull everything back together. And the fate of the universe is either to reach a maximum size and recollapse into a big crunch or to expand forever, ever slowing. However, if nothing has a mass and dark energy dominates, then the expansion of the universe will continue forever at an ever-increasing velocity. The galaxies not only are getting farther away from us, but are getting farther away from us at a fa with a faster and faster and faster velocity. This is why we have to do astronomy now. <laughs> Galaxies are getting farther away. Let's do astronomy now. 
So nothing matters. It will determine the ultimate fate of the universe. Now, how can nothing be something? How can nothing be something? So I asked my students uh, to close their eyes and think about nothing. Some of them are really good. <laughs> but think, uh, I went to sleep. Thinking, of, uh, uh, thinking about nothing is hard work. I should have thought about plugging in the laptop. So imagine a region of space that we'll call nothing. So it has no matter, it has no radiation in it, uh, it has nothing. And you can imagine constructing this by uh, taking a region of space, surrounding it by a hollow metal sphere, evacuating it, removing all of the material, in principle, cooling it to absolute zero, cooling it to absolute zero, removing all of the radiation, but what you can't remove from empty space, I may remember my password. tells us that at every point in space, it's possible for a particle and antiparticle to emerge from the vacuum, existing for a brief instant before annihilating and disappearing into the vacuum. So if we had microscopic eyes, we would not see empty space as quiescent. We would see it as a seething froth of particles and antiparticles coming out of the vacuum. Nothing is something. And nothing has energy. This should contribute to the energy of nothing. Also contributing to the energy of nothing is something known as the Higgs potential energy. Every point in space has a Higgs potential energy of 246,000 million electron volts. It is this Higgs potential energy which is responsible for mass of particles like electrons, Ws, and Zs. Another contribution to the energy of nothing may come from the existence of extra dimensions. My friends who are string theorists tell me that there are extra spatial dimensions. That's not true. I don't have any friends who are string theorists. But, but if I did, they would tell me that at every point in space there are extra dimensions. And these extra dimensions are wound up really tight. This should be a contribution to the energy of nothing. Finally, nothing changes. Today, the cosmo-illogical cosmo constant is absurdly small, but a fraction of the second after the bang, it had a reasonable value, 10 to the 100 times larger than today, and triggered a phase of the expansion of the universe known as inflation. Then this reasonable value for the energy of nothing went away to get this absurdly small value, so in fact nothing changes. I've convinced you, I think, that we have no understanding of the cosmological constant. <laughs> but the race is on to discover something of the nature of the cosmological constant. Dark energy only is apparent in how it affects the expansion of the universe. So we have to look out in space, back in time, to study the expansion history of the universe. And there's a new generation of telescopes, like LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that's being built, plans for even larger telescopes, 30-meter optical telescopes, telescopes on satellites in space, studying the evolution of the universe to quantify the behavior of dark energy. The American poet Walt Whitman said, to me, every hour of the light and dark is a miracle. Every cubic inch of space is a miracle. 
wouldn't it be great to see or experience a miracle? But in fact, every cubic inch of space is a miracle. If you think of the cubic inch of space under your nose, it contains 1,000 photons from the Big Bang, the remnant of the microwave uh, of the uh, hot primordial fireball. In every cubic inch of space, there's dark matter, dark energy, virtual particles coming in and out of the vacuum, Higgs potential energy. Perhaps there are even extra dimensions in every cubic inch of space. Every cubic inch of space is indeed a miracle. So what we've learned about the evolution of the universe is that for 14 billion years, our universe expanded, cooled, and evolved from a simple formless fog of primordial soup into a universe of galaxies, stars, and planets, forms most beautiful and most wonderful. I base these words on the words that were written in the, uh, by Charles Darwin on Origin of Species. He wrote, there is grandeur in this view of evolution. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Darwin was referring to the natural world we see around us, but he could have also been referring to the universe as a whole. So the takeaway message for you this evening is that 95% of the universe is a mystery. 25% of the universe seems to be in the form of something holding galaxies together, Something, and 70% of the universe is in the form of something pushing galaxies apart in the cosmic expansion. We have names for these, dark matter and dark energy, but naming is not explaining. These are the mysteries of the dark universe, the mysteries of the 21st century cosmology. I said that I thought modern cosmology, scientific cosmology, began with the work of Einstein, and we might wonder what Einstein would think today that 95% of the universe is a mystery. I think he would be happy. Einstein thought the most beautiful thing is the mysterious. To Einstein, it was the source of all true art and science. He thought those who are a stranger to mystery are as good as dead, their eyes are closed. Cosmologists today are no stranger to mystery 95% of the universe is a mystery. I started off talking about cosmic mysteries of previous generations, the mystery of the nature of stars, the mystery of the nature of galaxies. Today we face the nature of the mysteries of the dark universe. Previous cosmic mysteries have been solved and our cosmic mysteries, the, our mysteries of dark matter and dark energy will be solved also. Somewhere out there, there's a child with the genius, courage, and imagination to reach up and connect the inner space of the cosmos, the inner space of the quantum, with the outer space of the cosmos, to solve our cosmic mysteries, and more importantly, to discover their own cosmic mysteries. Thank you. No, no answers, but we no have time answers. for a few questions. Yes, please. I'm just curious. You uh, mentioned the density of empty space around 10 to minus 30 grams per cubic centimeter. I was curious, can you construct a sort of Planck density from H bar C and G that might suggest uh, that you talked about string theory and mentioned that string theory might be the solution to the dark that's, that, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, we, have, we deduce a certain energy of empty space to account for the observations of the expansion of the universe, 10 to the minus 30 grams per cubic centimeter. The question is, can you construct a fundamental density of space from, uh, new, from Planck's constant or the constants we know about from the uh, gravitational constant? And the answer is yes. Yes, we can. The trouble is, it's wrong by 120 orders of magnitude. <laughs> this, in fact, is the worst example of prediction compared to observation. 
120 orders of magnitude wrong. That's why it's a mystery. You said that um, Einstein was making an assumption that was shown to be wrong. <coughs> and I'm wondering if some assumptions that we might be making that could be equally wrong. Uh, the speed of light being constant throughout the universe, the gravitational constant, etc. Uh, how do we know that? Okay, so uh, let me repeat the question. So I said Einstein was wrong when he imagined a stationary cosmology. And you ask, uh, how do we know that we are not equally wrong about some fundamental thing that we think to be so. The speed of light is a constant, or maybe uh, the charge of the electron changes with time, gravity changes with time. And in fact, this is, these are all ideas that people are investigating as a possible explanation of dark energy. It could be that dark energy has nothing to do with the energy of space, that it's a property of space that we think exists, but it's not. Sort of the ether of the 21st century. But it's an exciting issue and an, and an exciting problem to work on because whatever the solution is, the answer is going to be something fundamental and wonderful. So maybe it's not a cosmological constant, but whatever it is will be even more interesting than a cosmological constant. So, you know, out of desperation, we are turning to crazy ideas for the cosmological constant, or crazy ideas for dark energy. Dark energy? So, so the question is, does dark energy density appear to be constant over time? And that is the one billion dollar question. Uh, this is the question that we want to know the answer to. Is it, in fact, a constant, or is it something else that's changing with time? And the only handle we have to study this now is to study how the expansion of the universe changes with time, that we use telescopes to, to try to study, space missions, and that is the billion-dollar question. Perhaps the answer to that question will guide our theoretical understanding of the nature of dark energy. See, there was a question. That, yes, sir. Um, so, so you mentioned, like, some of these telescopes that you said, that we don't know something about dark energy, dark matter, don't track the other thing that we know about the dark effect of radiation. They have some other attractions for gravity. Like, how, how are these proposals going to find these dark energy? So, so dark energy uh, provides, or the usual explanation for dark energy, is that it provides an energy of space, a mass of space that acts in such a way that it has a pressure, a negative pressure, that pushes space apart in the cosmic expansion. That's about all we know about it. Whether it's a constant or not, we can only put limits on. Whether it's related to a cosmological constant or something else, whether it's gravity, that's the problem that our Einstein did not have the last word on gravity, we don't know the answer to. So the only thing that we know is that the expansion of the universe is doing something strange that's unexpected, and we attribute that to dark energy. That's the mystery. Yes? Why is it the force, not just the energy? I'm sorry, say again? I still didn't hear it. That's entropy. Oh, entropy. It was a question about entropy. Yeah, why is it a force for expansion? So entropy is something that's well understood in a thermodynamic setting and measures the disorder of the system. What's not well understood is how to, how to understand entropy when gravity is included. So entropy tells us, no, th that's not your question. It was a good answer though, right? <laughs> well, why don't you see me after and I I'll, uh, I'll come up with the answer to maybe the question that you're asking. Maybe one more question here. What, what would be the implications of finding out in fact that the speed of light is not constant? 
The implications of the speed of light is not constant would overturn um, the, one of the bases of Einstein's theory of gravity. It would yield a new theory of gravity, a new either understanding of nature or misunderstanding of nature, depending upon your point of view. It would be a profound discovery. And uh, it, would, it would overturn so many things, it would be great. Thank you.